Welcome back, everyone. This is theCUBE's live coverage here in Las Vegas for SAS Innovate 2024. This is the Analyst Roundtable, Analyst Angle. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante, Rob Strache, both with theCUBE Research, and Ray Wong, who's a CUBE alumni and contributor to the CUBE Collective, also the founder of Constellation Research, legend in the industry. Probably one of the number one analysts in the industry. Ray, we see each other at events all the time. Um, you know, it's, it's seasoning, it's skin again. All the events are happening. You have the luxury of having that horizontally scalable observation space of all the different companies, the stories, AI washing, who's got the real deal. You're starting to see a lot of trends. What, what's your seeing? Obviously the big year we, we, we talked about last time on theCUBE was, let's find those workloads in production. That's going to be the test this year. What's, what are you seeing? What's your, what's your observations? Well, you know, John, it's more than just the workloads in production. We're trying to figure out who actually has the goods and who doesn't have the goods. And you're right, there's a lot of greenwashing going on, or AI washing as we call it out here, uh, in terms of what people have. Like as my kids would say, look, we could have done this in class with like 10 of our classmates in 30 days for half the stuff that's been announced so far this year. But what we have really is the difference between who can take something from data to decisions. And that's what SAS has here. And what they've been showing is really where models come into play, what you can do with the data. These guys are steeped in this. I'm more talking like decades of experience, and what they're trying to do is package it so it's going to be simple for customers to use. And it's been one of the things that have been burning SaaS for a long time. They've been seen as the legacy analytics company, they're slow to make a move, but you know what? It's in their benefit right now, because what it's, it's, show, it's showing up as, how do we make things easier with all the knowledge we know to get AI in the hands of people? And if there's anything, that's what they're trying to communicate at yeah. this event. And the AI really gives them a, a real accelerated tailwind to modernize and get a new opportunity to reshape their brand, because look at, let's face it, you don't want to be the grandfather's tool from the 90s and 80s, or even 40 years ago, so, but they have all the data, and last time you and I chatted, um, you know, we were talking about things like procurement, you know, is going to win from this new multimodal AI capabilities. So guys, I want to throw this out on the table and get your, all, all your reactions to this. There's this idea that you don't need to re raise the house and, and bulldoze everything. You can retrofit your workload. If you got an end-to-end -end workload, like a procurement workload last time we were talking, or whatever, and you got it, okay, it's, it's a known app, it's a workload. Well, you got to bring AI to it, so you're redesigning or retrofitting versus rebuilding the whole thing. Do you guys see it that way, or is that just for known workloads? Or are there new net workloads that, that are being built from scratch? And when do you tear down the house I and depends, rebuild? If I may, so All right, I mean, I think in. for these guys, the, the, the challenge that SaaS has is they got, and you know this, Rob, from looking at the data, yeah. the spending data, they got a, a lot of old legacy stuff that is, is big, it's a big part of their install base and the new stuff's not, it's growing at 30%. We heard that yesterday 30% and you know, several businesses, which is great, it's good growth rate, but it's not big enough to offset the, the decline. But they are monetizing. The 10% decline, and they are. Okay, so that's cool. But then you take a company like Blue Yonder that you, you know, and they're kind of re rewriting their whole stack. It's like the old Menugistics stack when they're saying, all right, give us some Snowflake and some relational AI. We want to reimagine the entire supply chain. So for them, it's appropriate, right? Now they still have to sort of manage the install base, but I think it's a lot easier to do so that. So you're saying all three are in place. It's, it's a lot easier to do that as a private company, I guess, is the point. Yeah, but the customer, the, I'm talking about the customer's workloads because there's cost concerns. Okay, I don't know what I'm throwing this against. I'm going to throw workloads at this. Or if I have a known work, workflow that's scoped and you know what it is, you can guess that may at least and then figure out the AI. So yeah. you bring in the AI to the table, which is maybe using AI or building AI. So this is kind of like the conversation, Ray, what do you think? Oh, Rob. Well I, I, well, I think, again, what they're doing is they're trying to bring in new people. I mean, they spent a, an awful lot of time talking about how you can manage Kubernetes <laughs> earlier today yeah. in, in the keynote, which I, I was like, okay, this is kind of a little bit odd, but they're using it for exactly that, the cost aspect. How do you scale up? How do you scale down? And then they talked about old ways of doing things batch and how you scale out batch, plus they also then had single store you know, Raj from Single Store on, on stage talking about streaming. So I, I think, again, they're trying to bridge that gap yeah. and do it in a way that says, okay, by the way, we're the guys who like invented doing ML and ML ops. I think that's, that's... Well, they got a legacy install base that's yeah. huge. Oh, These mass. guys got aspirations. The big thing is they got to grow the ecosystem, right? I mean, if they want to compete with the, the likes of Databricks, they've, they've got to have you know, more partners, because they but, can't do it but alone. But they got the workflows. 
their customers, they have a huge customer base. Yeah. Greg, yeah. what's your take on this? You know, I think the important thing is like they're basically doing three things at the same time. One, trying to modernize everything internally. Two, trying to actually tell the AI story. And three, trying to run an IPO. There's three plays going on here at the same time. And it's going to be interesting to see how they maneuver that. But if they get the AI story right, the IPO is taken care of. Yeah. It, what it, do you think it, about the IPO readiness? You guys think, you talked about but I guess the point I'm trying to make is that if, if they can sort of create that balance, that equilibrium between the decline of the old and the rise of the new, and that's, there's a crossover, that's a great IPO story. I mean, they have the users. Yeah. Back to John's point, right? What's going on? Every person in a role related to data, and if you're the expert, you're using SaaS, right? If you're hacking it, you're using something else. And that's really what they're trying to do is take the citizen data scientists, right, to like the experts and bring them all together. And that's why they're coming at across it from all different angles. And they got the workflows and data. That's my, that's what I'm, my observation is, is that if they could pull that off, and I think the monetization numbers, the 30% and what they talked about, is a good sign. The question that we don't know is what are they losing? Right, so, because when you go through these transition, we've seen every company that went to, went, went to uh, subscription or uh, managed service, there's usually a hit to the existing business. What do yeah. you guys see? I'm oh, not in the weeds the on this. the beauty of this with these guys, they have been subscription service from day one. Yeah. The contracts here at SaaS have been like, I'm going to take 30% uplift from your 1986 services agreement, right? Like every year it just keeps going like that. They were services before SaaS. Right, yeah. And, and, and I think that to that cost aspect of it, I think they've really worked with that. I mean, they brought on, this is the first year they've had a distributor and they're really focusing on channel. They're also focusing on people like yeah. AWS and the hyperscalers and as their other parts of their channel. And I, I think, again, to your point, I think they're making that transition and it's not an easy transition to be made. Yeah but transparency in their pricing out to the partners, they've had to get that right in the last six months, especially when you bring on a distributor. So and they are adding new partners, which is the interesting thing. I mean, for the first time, they've gone outside and they're actually looking at indirect sales as opposed to direct sales, which has been what their natural sales motion is. Right, and they, but they, I guess they need to 10X that, in my view, and they will. I mean, yeah. they, if, they, if they have aspirations of competing you know, with the big boys, yeah. so to speak, they, they got to do that. Well, there's all the IPO readiness, because you brought up the IPO. We haven't talked about that yet on theCUBE. Um, I think they're not, they're not den denying it, but they're also not <laughs> admitting it. No, but they're, means, they're not ready yet, because yeah. the numbers just aren't there. I mean, they have to have, they're going to have to have some kind of stronger top line growth in order to show that. They talked about 30% growth in revenue of VIA-based solutions. They talked about 30% revenue growth on VIA Cloud running on Azure. So that's good. I mean. We, you can always pick. And now they got AWS. You know, you know, they're extending the AWS is great, but you always cherry pick 30% growths, right? You got to, at the end of the day, Wall Street's going to look at the top line, they're going to look at the bottom line and say, all right, well, how's it all shake out? And if they're flat to down, that's not IPOable, right? They've got to be, I mean, it is IPOable, it's just not what they want. So they'll, my opinion, they'll settle that. Look at what Michael Dell did as a private company. They'll settle that behind the curtain and then they'll come do IPO. Ray, what's your, what's your advice or take on their IPO readiness? What would you advise Oh, I think them? they're working on a lot of things, right? They're cleaning up financials, they're getting that up to date, you know, they're actually putting some systems in. Uh, the other piece that they've been doing over time is they're changing the way their sales force, sales comps are actually set up, right? Their product releases are actually much more focused. I mean, they've done a lot of cleanup, but they're also trying to keep their SaaS values, right? This has been a company that's been taking care of their customers, their employees, and every one of their partners for a very long time, and they want to reflect that. This is also a legacy shift, right? This is is going from a private company where Dr. Goodnight built, you know, set things up in place, and he's going to want to make sure some of those values carry out forward. So they're putting all that in place, and that's not an easy ship to put, uh, but they've got some of the top people working on this, and the, the types of consulting, the types of people that they're bringing in, tells them they are serious about an IPO. This isn't, you know, this isn't Absolutely. just an announcement. And they've done, they've been through this before. They had a window a while ago, and they chose not to take it, but, but and it was probably a good choice, you know, given everything I mean, that's changed. It should be a monster IPO, I mean, they just, they, they wanted to stay private. I don't think they ever wanted to go public. They didn't before, yeah, and now they want to go public. And this could be the most, this could be the biggest AI uh, IPO in the market compared to any startup with like crazy valuation. These guys actually have real revenue, yeah. right? Well, We're talking like two billion, three billion plus of real revenue. Yeah. Right. And, and real customers. And it's north of three billion. It's north of three billion. You know, three, call it 3.2. I'm not sure why you disclose yeah. Three point <laughs> two. <laughs> I, I mean, I just know. But yeah, right, you're, you, right. You're, I'm not under NDA for the revenue. But, um, but you know, but, but it's again. It's, I'll wink. It's, I'll wink at the numbers. It's, it's <laughs> flattish, you know, right? But, you know, Kara Swisher made this point. She goes, hey, you know, there's a lot of hype and a lot of valuation going around AI. But there's not a lot of revenue. These guys actually have yeah. you know, real revenue. And I, I think that we're, we're even seeing that with some of the people who are looking at IPOs this year. I mean, outside of Databricks and you know, that, 
one in particular, you start to look out beyond them and you start to go, okay, really? At that valuation? Or they're getting funding thrown at them at like nine, ten billion dollar valuations and you're starting to go, okay, that's kind of a head scratcher based on what we know about their sales and how lumpy it is or what have you. These guys have had a very good, you know, steady base yeah. and really fanatical and, customers. And, and Tropic's got an evaluation, what, the mid 20 billion, oh, 25 yeah. billion? Yep, yep. I mean, what's, what's Anthropic's uh, revenue? Uh, they, they're, they're going to get smoked. <laughs> this would be a great idea. All right, guys, I'm the customer. I'm the person. I'm writing big, fat checks. I want to go public. I come to you guys, the advisory. What do I need to work on? I got a blank check. I got my team. Where are the gaps? I want to go public. I want to be ready. I want my products to be great. What do I have to do to get from a point A to point B? Ray, we'll start with you. What's the, you know, oh, tell, me what, them, need, tell get, me what I need to work on. They've got to get this AI story down. They've got to show the subscription revenue growth as they're going from on-prem to cloud, which is one of the big challenges, but they've actually been showing growth and via, as you've been talking about, Dave. Yeah. Uh, and I think the third thing really is they have to show that they've got a management team that goes beyond Dr. Goodnight over time, and they've been doing that. They've, been be they've removed and replaced a lot of people along the way, they've promoted a lot of people within, and you're seeing a very, very different team and a very different mentality. We were at their SaaS analyst day a couple months back, and I can tell you, it's a very, very different SaaS here than what would be just even three years ago. Yeah, they're, they're on point on, on, our, on their AI stuff, they're on point, and they, from the Explore, the last event we had theCUBE to here, they've already delivered. I mean, they're first to sell models. Lightweight models, I mean, that's pretty impressive. And they got the subscription. I mean, so I, I like what they're doing. They, they have good product shops. But Rob, any, yeah. any thoughts on, on what yeah. you think they need to work on? I, I think, you know, building off of what Ray was saying, I think you can look at how they're going, go to, their go-to-market is happening, and I think, again, talking what Dave was talking about, partners and ecosystem, they really need to jump in full, full on with that because I think part of that will help them in that runway to get to repeatability, that ARR, and give them that runway that gets them the eight plus quarters of success of growth that gives them the numbers that then they can go out with. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, that's, I, I totally agree. I think they got to really think about their go to market. They got to dramatically expand their alliances and partnerships. I do think, I, I'm excited about the AWS partnership. I mean, I, you know, okay, it's nice that they're do, doing Azure. I think it, AWS could be even more productive for Dude, them. Can you imagine SaaS on the marketplace? Yeah, oh my exactly. God, that's I mean, absolutely blow doors. Jassy, like, you know, on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would be, like, be like awesome thing to watch. The guy's Did right you see him yesterday, out. good night? Yeah. Hey, he was, he was great. Yeah. He's snarky as ever. We're not an interpreter, we actually compile our code. I love that. And he's probably doing the yeah. compiling, too. Yeah. <laughs> 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 really yeah. uh, uh, we have one person here that was a programmer in SAS. Yeah, well, I, I did. I started, my, I started my first job out of college was using SAS to do data, data analysis. And I, I think, again, I, I, I've been geeking out this entire week here. It's been, you know, you feel the energy of the geekness here that just is fantastic. Like you said, the semicolon. I mean, I never, I was, yeah. I never had a job programming in SAS, but we learned it in college. Yeah. You had to learn SAS, you had to learn SPSS. There yeah. was no R right. at the time. Uh, right. Yeah. I never used SAS ever as a product. Yeah. Like, honestly, <laughs> it was I've before Python it. and R yeah, yeah, and all that no stuff. Well, I mean, they got Workbench, that looks really solid. I mean, the product side looks really good. And they're working hard, and, and you're right. I've been, we've been talking to the team too, we got to know them. Good culture here. Uh, this culture is going to have to turn into a growth culture. Ray, this is not the country yeah, exactly, club, John. right? Oh. So this is going to have to move from kind of that HP, the old school IBM with the big campus uh, and great people. I think they can pull it off. HP did it, obviously. We know the HP when I was there. Um, so all good stuff. The thing that I'm, I'm, I've been thinking about in this industry relative to this is that is AI, I'm not saying a redo, is AI an opportunity for the game to change the pecking order of the leaders? Because if you look at SaaS, and what, what I've been bullish on SaaS is, is that they got the customers that have the data, they got the workflows, and AI is absolutely a lever for them to catapult them to another level, and it's gettable. Ray, guys, what, what, what companies are out there that could, could really move the needle? Legacy companies or existing companies that could use AI to springboard and propel them to the front of the pack versus the hype side, which is like the, the anthropics of the world, which have massive valuations. Who's, who's ripe for AI to go from challenger or pretender or you know, forgotten, Steady she goes. Strangely enough, Oracle. 
right? Oracle's sitting on the same kind of assets that SaaS has uh, across the board, plus Oracle Cloud is actually operating at one-seventh or one-tenth the cost of everybody else. Uh, so they've got all the pieces in place to actually do that, and they've been running ML for quite some time, and they've also, they were smart enough to buy a lot of NVIDIA GPUs early at a really lower price than everyone else. So much like, I mean, we saw Bing searches now run on Oracle Cloud. I, mean, <laughs> I have to laugh every time I hear that. Yeah, and I, I think it's a great point. I mean, and to me it's not strange, I think Oracle, Larry's always invested in R&D, so you got to give him props for that. It's geek I, to geek, yeah. I think, yeah, totally. I think, I do think IBM, I, I've said, I've, I haven't been excited about IBM in, in 10 years, but I think actually the mistakes they made with Watson 1.0, trying to put it in places where it didn't belong, I think they learned a lot, and they've actually got some pretty good products, and they could have PLG. When, when was the last time IBM had product-led growth? It's been a, been a long, long time. I think beyond the picks yeah. and shovels, you're starting to see like yeah. Adobe, I think Adobe, has done a pretty good job. So, with, so it really comes down to who has AI. assets that are aligned with AI. That yep. seems to be Yeah, the, no, I, the trend. I agree. I, I think IBM's in a great shape uh, to do that. They've rationalized what they're actually doing. They know what they're not going to do. Yes. I think that's a very important point. You guys have talked to Roger Premo. I mean, these guys are focused. You see what's happening on Rob Thomas' side. And you also know, like, I mean, they're investing heavily, Arvin's investing heavily in assets that actually make things easier for customers, not harder. And I think when you think about the stuff that's going on in, in the research labs, with Dario Gill, and Rob Thomas and the go-to-market, they're very much aligned, and that's yeah. been misaligned for years. They say, hey, we're going to do all these science experiments, and they're never going to get to market. And that's always been a huge problem. I think Arvin's fixed that. Rob, what yeah, you, I, what's your take? Yeah, I, I think, again, there's, you know, when you get below that level, I think there's people like Teradata, Informatica, obviously SAS, and a number of others that AI is going to help. These are the people who have the pedigrees. I, also Oracle on the Exadata side, they're sitting on so much data and they have customers that use that because the stuff works. What, so what I think there's a lot, of, a lot of really good pieces out there that could be enabled by AI. What, what really about grow. Salesforce? What's your take on Salesforce and well, AI? Salesforce has the pieces in there, but they've got to yeah. clean up their shop internally. Uh, so the data, doc, the data cloud stuff is really smart. It's the first place they can finally do all that And it's doing in well place, in the market. And yeah. that's actually doing very well. Yeah. Uh, we'll see if they do this Informatica deal. That's going to be interesting yeah. to watch. I mean, we're kind of like, are you buying growth or is there a really strategic asset here? And we'll have to find out where that actually comes down could to. Could it be both in your opinion? It could be both. Yeah. It could be trying to do that. Uh, and then back to you on companies like Boomi. Boomi's another one. Anyone's yeah. in this integration space that has to handle data movement is going to benefit from AI. And in the process space as well. Companies like a Salonis doing on the process mining side. Yep. And of course UiPath trying to get that automation in place. They yeah. all have a big role in this AI. Okay, so what industries kind of fall by the wayside? Or better yet, which magic quadrants don't, don't become relevant? Is ML ops dead? Is it change over? Is AI ops I think traditional over? RPA is, you know, yeah. it's a good target. I think UiPath's done a good job of moving beyond trying to get to enterprise-wide, but you know, there's a chunk of their business in the old legacy RPA that Gen AI can do a lot of that. I'm waiting for an agent's tragic quadrant in squares of the spirit, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm not sure if they're yeah. at, so we'll find out. So. Yeah, I, I think ServiceNow is another one that's leaning in, yeah, where they were big now. into the RPA, yeah. but now they're leaning into the AI and trying to well, reinvent ServiceNow's themselves. ServiceNow's interesting. It's that layer that abstracts all the yeah. crap from all the old transactional systems. You have to do that first, and so I think that definitely has a role. Yeah. Guys, great, great analysis. I mean, action-packed. I think we just basically solved all the industry problems. Uh, final question as we wrap up. Where are we on the industry change? If you had to scope it or even kind of describe our historical life in, in, in tech, I mean, for me, I feel like this is a really weird time in a good way that it's changing. What's your thoughts, guys, on what is actually happening in the industry? I'm talking about all actors, all participants. Oh. What, what is your take, Ray? Because, I mean, this is, a, this is the script has been flipped, okay? Things are going to get Really okay. weird and hairy very quickly. I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting six to eight calls a day about people losing their jobs in the valley. And it is, it is just happening. We're seeing hundreds of, hundreds of people being laid off every day. I don't know how they're being replaced, but there are three factors here. We're in the year of exponential efficiency. The consulting firms like BCG, Bain, and McKinsey all went and said, if you don't cut your cost, your stock price is going to tank. Everybody ran that playbook. We're now also in the middle of AI arbitrage, right? Where we've had this pyramid now being carved out into a diamond uh, because we're actually using AI to do a lot of that work. And then the third piece is a margin compression we have never seen before. And I, it's, I'll give you a simple example. Like you take UPI in India, that's their payments gateway. It's operating at pennies per transaction. Our payment gateways are running at a dollar per transaction or more, and that's actually creating compression. You're also seeing it, for example, you can buy Zoho at $100 per user versus buying all the other players that you need for $1,000 per user. Margin compression is here, and it's going to be interesting. And that's what's driving yeah. everything in the industry, where tech used to be the disruptor, 
it's no longer the disruptor, it's the barrier, it's holding things into status quo, and so something's about to come and knock that over, and we're not sure what. And Google's the one company that yeah. hasn't yeah. taken a ton of cost out, but still yeah. could potentially. I think when you see these waves, yeah. it's like Kara was saying, the revenue's not there, and so the new stuff's not big enough yeah. to offset the decline in the old stuff, and so as a result, they're going after labor yeah. and to drop into the bottom line. Well, it, well, it, you, it, you bring it, up Google, it, which is the one that was all over the news this week about yeah. the fact that they're replacing people in finance with AI. Yeah. And I, I find it really interesting that they're all, again, looking at the cost and taking that all out. It's not just I, them. I was yeah. talking to head of RevOps at a company I won't name. They're down, they had it 10% automated, they expect to be 50% automated by the end of the year. They're going to have one half the finance people they need. And if you're not in sales leadership or in development, you're out of the valley. You need to be somewhere else like Austin, North Carolina, or New York. Right, I mean, that, I, I think you, you bring up a good point. And from my observation, I think we're, gonna, we're in a tech where the tech is the glue holding things together to your point, but also it's in everything now. So it's, the growth has already happened, now it's ubiquitous, so this incremental value, it's going to be workflows and data is the new IP, and I think that's a business leadership challenge, and, and, and everything else will be a subsystem of some hybrid automation. One more thing, every customer is pissed at their vendor. They're, they've got a gun to their head, no one's negotiating, people are trying to drive down costs and the vendors are trying to jack up costs. It's a tenuous relationship going on there. It's going to be a revolution and the customers Especially are in charge. Especially in sales. Yeah. Okay, so it's a revolution and the customers are in charge. I think customers feel like they're not because there's only two vendors to choose from in every category. Oh boy, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be interesting. When that stuff gets set up. And only one up, in GPUs. Only one in GPUs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Everyone great. is down to the mass. It's going to be a cold little war going on. Yeah. Guys, great. Analyst Angle, that was super exciting. Yeah. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante and theCUBE team. We'll be right back with more after this short break. <laughs>